Hi, I'm Dr. Samuel Seed from the Skin Cancer and Cosmetic Clinic and welcome again to our video channel. Now today, I'm going to talk to you about a very common yet distressing pigmentary condition called melasma. Have you wondered why you suddenly develop this unwanted pigmentation on your forehead or your cheeks or even on your upper lip after a big sun exposure? You could have a condition called melasma. This is often triggered off by the sun, hormonal factors and genetic factors. Now, about 90 to 95 percent of people who actually develop this melasma are females and about three to five percent of these people are in men if you stay tuned i'll explain to you why you develop melasma and not everyone gets melasma uh, what are the strategies that we use in treating melasma and in the end i'll talk about how to minimize recurrence of this melasma and how to manage this chronically relapsing condition Remember to subscribe and like our video so that we can keep you informed of any new videos that we make on common skin conditions. I'll bring you to the room now. Let's have a look at a condition called melasma. So what actually triggers off melasma? Most importantly, ultraviolet rays from the sun. So you find that you develop melasma overnight. Um, you could have preceded uh, an activity where you've gone in the sun, whether it's a skiing day or a day hiking or playing tennis, that can suddenly just trigger off melasma. Hormonal factors is very important, uh, especially sex hormones such as estrogen and progesterone. So if you're taking the oral contraceptive pill, which contains estrogen and progesterone, um, that actually primes your skin to be more likely to develop melasma. Of course, genetic factors is an important thing. Um, not everybody that takes a pill or fall pregnant actually develop melasma. If you've got a family history of uh, melasma, like your sister or your mom, you're actually more prone uh, and a higher risk of developing melasma during these events. Now, before I talk about active treatment for melasma in terms of what topical agents, in terms of prevention, uh, sunscreen is of paramount importance. Okay, whether you're actively treating melasma, whether you're at home, uh, uh, that's very important. You want to choose a sunscreen with a high sun protection factor, at least uh, 30 plus. Nowadays, I would advise people to have a 50 plus sunscreen. Um, most sunscreens in Australia are broad spectrum, which means that it covers both, both ultraviolet A and ultraviolet B. And um, uh, they're broad spectrum because it contains a physical barrier and it also has a chemical barrier. Physical barrier is like putting an umbrella on top of your head and it kind of covers it because it, it's, a, it's a physical block. And things can come into uh, ingredients that they use is things like titanium oxide, zinc oxide, and in some sunscreens, uh, iron oxide. Um, there's a whole myriad of chemical barriers, I won't go into that, but the one to choose is the one that suits your skin, okay? So you've got, uh, I mean from the chemists or some of the sunscreens we use in our clinic, um, it really, you've got to choose something that suits your skin. If you have an acne prone problem, you might use a, a, a mattifying sunscreen which actually sucks the oil out of your skin. Um, if you if you want a little bit of cover to camouflage your melasma, you might choose one of uh, the sunscreen that has a sheer tint or a tinted sunscreen. Um, some people have very dry skin, they might have a moisturizing sunscreen. And um, uh, some people like to have a very nice textured one specifically made for the face. You can have one that's made specifically for the face. Uh, and uh, some people buy an uh, all-purpose sunscreen. Uh, that you can also use for your whole body okay so whether you're you're at home or you're outside playing sports um, you need to put on the sunscreen if you're playing water sports you have some sunscreens that are water resistant and so make sure you get those and when you get out of the water remember to reapply uh, i would always tell people if you have melasma best to avoid the sun if you like swimming or playing tennis do indoor swimming play night tennis for example all right, so remember, um, uh, day or night, use sunscreen. Uh, why I say night? Because sometimes people have very strong lights at home. You're in front of the computer screen for long periods of time. That sometimes can contribute to your melasma as well. Um, I'd like to bring you to the other room, talk a little bit about active treatment for melasma. I'll just explain to you uh, a little bit about the skin and why pigment forms. I've drawn a little diagram of the skin over here. So imagine that's your eyes just looking down and these are the layers of the skin on the surface um, on the surface and this is called the epidermis. Down here is the second layer of the skin called the dermis where blood vessels and collagen fibers and all that um, are accumulated. 
Now, on your skin, interspaced between your skin are these pigment producing cells called the melanocytes. And it's actually like, like an octopus, it's got little tentacles that would reach into each of these cells on the epidermis. So these cells are called keratinocytes, they don't contain pigment naturally, but when there's ultraviolet rays from the sun that stimulates the melanin, it makes little pigment packages called melanosomes. And you see these little black dots over here? And it makes it in the body of the melanocytes and it's transported up via these little tentacles to each and every one of these cells. So each melanocyte can have multiple tentacles going to a series of, you know, between 10 to 30 different keratinocytes. I have another melanocyte here and another melanocyte here. So when you're exposed to the sun, a normal melanocyte will try to protect the skin by making melanosomes or pigment packages and line these cells. That's why you get a tan. Some people don't have effective tan, they actually develop uh, freckles. Um, now, initially, we thought that the uh, conditioned melasma is due to a defective melanocyte. But now, research is pointing towards a more heterogeneous uh, cause, uh, interplay between the keratinocyte, uh, the mast cells, um, there's some gene uh, regulation abnormalities, and also new blood vessel formation uh, under the skin in the dermis, and also the basement membrane disruption. Uh, it all sounds quite complicated, but I'll put it simply in a diagram to explain to you what all that actually means. It's good to understand this so that you can understand the treatment strategies later on. So imagine these are the melanocytes. Uh, there's a little blood vessels down here. And initially we thought that these melanocytes uh, are the main culprit, which it is. When it's ultraviolet rays, it causes these melanocytes to make more pigment. There's also a, a cell called the mast cell which lives in the um, dermis of the skin and when there's ultraviolet rays, there's inflammation, it secretes histamine. Histamine, this mast cell is also involved in allergy response. So when it's inflammation, histamine is made, it goes and it's involved, um, uh, it causes some pigment in the epidermis of your skin cells, of your skin. Uh, a new thing that has been discovered uh, is called the vascular endothelial growth factors or VEG, um, VEGF. It actually stimulates new blood vessel formation. And this new blood vessel formation under the skin would, or, or would trigger off and give off factors that would trigger off this uh, uh, melanin production in the melanocytes. The mast cell also secretes a substance that sometimes causes the disruption of the basement membrane. See this dark line that separates the epidermis from the dermis? Now if there's breaks or disruption of the, the basement membrane, it sometimes causes these melanocytes to actually drop down into the dermis and it proliferates and that's what we call dermal melasma. Now dermal melasma is extremely hard to treat because um, it is way down in the skin even uh, topical therapies, chemical peels and lasers would find it rather hard to, to treat these um, uh, dermal melasma. Hi, I'm going to talk to you about uh, uh, now topical agents. But just before that, you remember we have to remove the triggering factors. Now, triggering factors for melasma could be the oral contraceptive pill. It could be that you've had an implanon impl implanted in you and it's constantly releasing estrogen and progesterone. So that could be a constant trigger factor. And some people who haven't identified the trigger factors and they, they, they come in for therapy and they get treatments done and only to find that melasma comes back all the time. So if you can identify the trigger factor, um, uh, treat it first. It could be stopping the oral contraceptive pill or consideration in stopping the hormone replacement therapy or removing the implanon and using an alternative form of contraception. Uh, for some people who are playing sports all the time in the sun, uh, such as uh, tennis or swimming outdoors, consider doing indoor tennis and indoor swimming. Okay, a simple solution. Now, let's look at topical agents. I know it's actually quite a big topic, a confusing topic for many, but for uh, your purposes, let's make it very simple, straight down to the bare bones, and I won't go into the boring details of each single element of each chemical. Um, I will bring you back to the skin. Essentially, when you are, we are using topical therapy, there's only three types, three main strategies. 
one, remember, the pigment producing cell, the melanocyte is making pigment and it's transported by its tentacles to keratinocytes, which is the skin, uh, and that's how uh, melasma happens. And it's an abnormal production of pigment into the cells. So one form of topical agents would inhibit the melanocyte. So it minimizes the production of melanin by this cell, right? And things such as hydroquinone, phytic acid, kojic acid, arbutin, um, uh, licorice, uh, azelaic acid, these are all examples of creams that actually help them um, uh, reduce the production of pigment. Another um, strategy is to reduce the transport of these pigment packages into the epidermis to line the keratinocytes with abnormal pigment. And vitamin B3 or nicotinamide is a good one. And we have creams in the, uh, that we prescribe and use in the clinic specifically to do that. The third uh, uh, very commonly used is people who already have epidermal pigment and we want to exfoliate the skin. Okay? And very commonly used are chemical peels or sometimes home use creams that contain alpha hydroxy acids, such as glycolic acids, sometimes even beta hydroxy acids. Uh, retinoids, which is vitamin A derived cream, um, and also people who have uh, different forms of chemical peels that, that exfoliate the skin or salicylic acids uh, like aspirin. So all these are strategies that we use topically. Um, in the clinic, we have different kinds of cream that would contain a mix or sometimes individual components of this such as you've got ASAP, you've got vitamin A to exfoliate the skin, vitamin B to reduce trans or B3 to tr reduce transfer of pigment to the cells, uh, vitamin C uh, a direct effect on the the uh, melanocytes in making pigment and then you've got like things like the brightening serum which has got a combination of these things. Um, Procura also makes a retinoid cream, uh, vitamin A creams and it's got nicotinamide so it goes on both strategies of uh, exfoliating the skin and, and redu reduction of transfer of pig pigment to the keratinocytes. Uh, one extremely good one we use a lot is the miso aesthetic Cosmolan 2 cream. Uh, we often do this not alone but we use it in combination with a Cosmolan peel which is an excellent peel, uh, one of the best for melasma in, 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 in our topical strategy. Um, for some people who have more sensitive skin um, Dermaceutics make a cream called Mela Cream. It contains very, a lot of the uh, good ingredients um, that has, uh, uh, can reduce the production of melanin and also the transfer of melanin to the, to the uh, keratinocytes. So in essence, that's the um, strategies that we use for topical treatment. Uh, one other thing is what is new, it was often used also a tablet, um, transidamic acid. It does help inhibit uh, melasma and it's taken orally. It works on, on inhibiting a, a thing called plasmin which actually works on the mast cell and reduces the mast cell in making new blood vessels that stimulate uh, melanin production. It also uh, reduces this mast cell from making a tryptase uh, because this tryptase can actually break down the skin uh, giving more wrinkles and lines and it also causes disruption of the basement membrane where if you break this protective layer, uh, the pigment cells and the abnormal pigment can kind of drop down deeper into the skin, which makes it really hard to treat. And I'll talk to you later on about using uh, laser therapy um, as a strategy. Um, and of course, uh, the mast cell, as you know, it's uh, a cell that's involved in, in allergy. So it secretes histamine and Transdynamic acid, the tablet, actually also stops histamine, which histamine has also, besides allergy, has a direct effect on the melanocytes making epidermal pigment. So these are some of the uh, strategies that we use um, topically and the new oral therapy. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about lasers for treatment of melasma. The approach is a little bit different and the concept is also, also a little bit different and it's excellent strategy for maintenance of uh, uh, melasma after you've treated with topical therapy or as a, a standalone therapy for people who have very sensitive skin and can't use topical therapy. So I would like to bring you to my laser room and talk to you about some of the strategies using lasers. Hi, welcome to our laser room that we use to treat melasma. It's got uh, uh, some picosecond lasers and a nanosecond laser uh, that we use to treat patients. 
who have ongoing melasma for acute treatment or for ongoing maintenance treatments. Um, just before I do that, a little diagram again. Imagine that's your skin cells, you've got melanocytes, pigment producing cells. The white ones are producing pigment at a normal rate. The red ones are the melanocytes that are making pigment at an abnormal rate. So one of the strategies is using laser to help reset these melanocytes so that it goes back to a normal rate of producing pigment. Um, another diagram, how lasers work in breaking down pigment. Uh, now, unlike some of the IPL lasers, carbon dioxide, albumin react lasers and things like that, uh, we are using lasers that are not actually targeting melanin. We are not targeting pigment as a chromophore. We are, we are actually delivering a lot of energy in a very short space of time and trying to shatter the pigment. Imagine the pigment is like a big huge rock, like a boulder, and we are trying to shatter it into little small stones or um, in some lasers that with even shorter pulse duration uh, into little bits of sand. So imagine this is a, your skin again and you got a block of melasma in there. Um, we are using uh, nanosecond lasers which is 10 to the power of minus 9 such as the red light laser behind me over there and it, when, it, when the laser is delivered onto the pigment uh, it shatters it into little stones. Now you've got scavenger cells under your skin that chomps it up called macrophage and chomps it up. Sometimes they're too big and you need further treatments and multiple treatments to break it down to little bits of sand before the scavenger cells or your macrophage can swallow it. Now another type of laser which is even shorter pulse duration, we're talking about 10 to the minus 12 of a second with each pulse is for example like our Plutonium Star Walker laser which has a nanosecond pulse with picosecond peaks. And that, when that laser when it's delivered onto the rock it can shatter it into small little bits of sand, okay? And of course, when it's like sand, your scavenger cells or your Pac-Man cells can just chomp, chomp, chomp and chop it off. So the result is faster with a picosecond laser, takes a little bit longer with the old, older nanosecond laser. But each has its uh, benefits and there's a role for each of them in the treatment of melasma. So I'm going to next turn on the laser and just show you what it's actually like um, having a treatment. Now unlike in the past where we use lasers just to shatter the pigment uh, and not treating the, the, the source of it, uh, pigment tends to just recur and people with melasma in the past, you treat it, it gets better and then it becomes recurring and, and they just have to have constant treatment. And that may still be the case for you, uh, especially if we can't uh, delineate the, the causal factor of, of, of your melasma. But remember, there is blood vessel formation that feeds the melasma. There is abnormal pigment on the, on the epidermis, on the surface of the skin. And sometimes you have abnormal pigment in the dermis, right? So I remember the, the diagram I showed you, you might have pigment that is made on the surface of the skin called epidermal melasma. And sometimes there's basement membrane that is broken and some of these pigment cells and abnormal pigment falls down over here into the dermis and it causes dermal melasma which is a little bit harder to treat. So we're now going to sand the laser down to shatter the pigment here and shatter the pigment here. And, and of course the different depths that the, uh, of your target uh, is still determined by our spot size. So how big the spot size is with the laser is how deep it can go. So I'll try to show you a bit about how we use multi-strategy laser to, to treat the condition. Um, I'll put on the protective glasses first. And this is the Futona Star Walker laser. Uh, I'll just demonstrate. Step one, we are using a pretty large 8mm spot size. Okay, and we're going to use uh, picosecond pulses. Um, large spot size, it can penetrate quite deep. And we use actually very gentle energy, only 1.3 joules. Uh, I'll, I'll demonstrate it on my hand. You can see my hand is hardly red at all. Uh, I don't have any anesthetic on, uh, the laser is now ready, you can see the, the uh, aiming beam and I can activate it. Okay, so I just gently move over the entire area that we're treating and it just feels like a tiny little bit of end bite sensation. There's no anesthetic and you can just move it and we do it multiple passes and that's just to demonstrate to you what the first part of the laser is. Now the second part of the laser that uh, or we change different mode 
is now using a thing called frag 3 okay and we change it to a four millimeter spot size uh, what this actually does it's, it's treating the more superficial layers of the skin it's got an anti-inflammatory effect a wet effect um, treats the cytokines which is the inflammatory cascade um, that involved the, in the inflammatory cascade and also uh, it reduces the vascular endothelial growth factors which stimulates those vessels under the skin that keep stimulating the melanocytes from making pigment so I'll start the laser and again when we do this second part of the laser treatment for melasma, you can see the aiming beam there. It's a much smaller aiming beam. Okay. So this feels a little bit different from before. Just a tiny bit of heat and as the laser is being triggered. And we actually go through the whole phase about three or four times. Okay. And we might go side to side. Uh, but that's just to demonstrate to you what the laser is like. Okay. I'll demonstrate the, the third part, probably not the fourth part because it's a little bit more complex uh, in this setting, um, but this part of it is if you have some visible blood vessels, especially if it's seen under four times magnification, we also want to shut down those blood vessels because they actually contribute to feeding the melasma condition. Uh, now we're going to go 1064 up to an eight. So we're gonna go and change this to a 4 millimeter spot, now hang on we're going to change it to a 2 millimeter spot size here you go, this one okay. so this 2 millimeter spot size is a very focused energy high energy but a longer pulse duration that can actually treat large vessels so I'll just show you again uh, for, for, for your interest purposes this is what the laser looks like when we shut down the vessels so it's a lot slower when we treat it but we can feel that each pulse is a little bit more hot and that helps shut down little tiny visible vessels um, at four times magnification okay the last laser i won't demonstrate here because it involves me changing this head and it's making a little uh, fractional holes in the skin without heat uh, using a photoacoustic um, uh, effect to make holes and that actually increases collagen texture of the skin um, helps with lines and wrinkles as well but it also helps with the penetration of your topical creams at home when you actually um, do a fractional laser on your hand so that's uh, the demonstration of how lasers work a little uh, laser demonstration has helped you understand uh, what having a laser treatment for melasma is like um, now so in conclusion Melasma is actually a, a acquired condition of hyperpigmentation primarily of the darker skin types and more common in females. Uh, treatments can be quite varied, can be topical treatments and can be laser treatments. Initially our understanding is that it's a defective uh, melanocyte problem but now as uh, more studies have been done it's also an interplay between uh, the, the melanocyte, the keratinocyte in the skin and also the mast cells and also blood, underlying blood vessels. So with more understanding of these, our strategies has improved and our treatment strategies uh, for individual patients have changed. Uh, if you do have that condition, more than happy to see you at our clinic for a consultation. If you like the video and help, hope that um, I've given you some good insight to your condition, uh, please uh, like our channel and subscribe to it. I hope to bring you more information in the future of uh, common skin problems that um, affect a lot of people. So over and out.